Okay, welcome to the second talk of the afternoon session. Our speaker is Kim van Veek, who will talk to us about automating infrastructure at SA Home Loans. Take it away. Right, let's get the microphone working. How's that? Uh, everyone hear me? Yes? Yep. No? Good? Um, I'm trying to hear it echo back at me. There we go. My head's too big. Really. Right. Sorry, still head's still too big. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Kim van Veek, as uh, Neil has pointed out. I'm a DevOps engineer with SA Home Loans. To get the corporate pitch out of the way, if it surprises you to hear that De SA Home Loans has DevOps engineers, you might be surprised to learn we have an 80-strong IT department. We develop most of our software in-house. It's um, mainly C-sharp, which I wasn't going to bring up at a Python conference, but we do do Python and Node and various other bits as well. We deploy everything ourselves. If a lifestyle change appeals and you'd like to live by the ocean, give us a shout. We've got a nice big office, massive glass walls looking onto the ocean. Many people go surfing before they come to work, etc., etc. Right, I've done the corporate plug. I've satisfied the plane ticket they paid for me to come here. Let's talk the main stuff. What I'm going to talk about is what we did at ESA Home Loans to take the existing prod infrastructure and the for rather error-prone methods we had of getting that replicated so our teams could work on it, and what we did to automate that. I just want to point out up front, I'm in no way suggesting this is the only way to do it. I'm not suggesting this is the best way to do it. This is just what worked for us. Furthermore, one of the main takeaways I'd like to get is that there is a, a certain fear for this kind of thing that it's really hard to do or you need super skilled people or massive teams or years of time. None of that is true. You can do it relatively simply, and I don't want to tell my bosses it was relatively simple, but to, I'll tell the room it's not as complicated as you might think. So, Move on to where we stand. What the in infrastructure is at SA Home Loans and any company of medium size or more who's been around for more than a couple of years, in other words, who isn't a startup, you'll have, a, I suspect, a similar kind of system. We've got approximately 40 Windows servers, almost all of them virtualized, running our own internally developed Windows services, and then the Windows infrastructure that goes with that, Active Directory and Exchange and services running through IIS and the like. We also have seven Ubuntu servers in Prod, which are effectively Docker hosts, and that's all they're doing. Um, we then take that production environment and we replicate it 18 times. We've got approximately 18, no, that's not true. We've got approximately five or six dev teams. Each of them gets two labs and a variety of other labs. So ultimately, we end up taking what's 50 servers, 18 times, 900 virtual machines. Um, manual, managing that manually was getting quite old. So as I point out, five agile development teams, we've got a frontline support, our DBAs, our platforms, our DevOps, everyone gets their own sandbox. There's also some additional infrastructure to make that work. Um, everything is netted so that team A, team B, and team C can get to their machines by going to team A server oneshlcom and team B server 2shlcom etc. DNS entries to make that work. And then, sorry, DNS entries is how they do that. The point of the netting is that every lab thinks it's prod. So uh, we have a regrettable system, which again is probably not new. A lot of our stuff is hard coded to look for server A1.2.3.4 instead of a particular name. So in your lab, 1.2.3.4 has to go to the right one in the lab and not prod, or things get broken, and that's not pretty. So there's a various amount of netting and so forth that goes on in there as well. And for the same reason, all our labs have internal host names. So if I go to server 1 in the lab, it goes to the right machine, and then when I deploy that code to prod, it still goes to server 1, and we don't need config changes that break between labs and prod. Problems with our labs? We built them manually, as in literally somebody sat down and typed all the commands into a terminal or otherwise right-clicked in VMware or whatever tool they were using at the time to make it happen. This was, to put it politely, labor-intensive. Took at least a week, at least, sometimes two. It didn't work. The labs you ended up with were not the same across the board. They were all inconsistent with each other. They didn't really look like prod as much as they should. And this is simply because it is very difficult for a human to repeat 80 steps the same way each time and get everything 100% right. And there was no DIY capacity at all. If something was wrong in the lab, and inevitably something was wrong in the lab, you had to come and get one of the DevOps guys or the, the support team to fix it for you. Now, when I say there's 80 engineers or 80 software developers, there's six support guys. Six support guys, 18 labs. You see we're a little bit busy. You might have to wait a couple of days for someone to get to you, and now you're not being productive. So what did we do? 
we automated almost everything. And I say that slightly tongue-in-cheek, we didn't automate almost everything, we automated the important things. And to do that, we looked at a, a bunch of open source tools. And again, I hasten to add, this is not necessarily the only list you could look at, but this is what worked for us. We picked up Pekka, which was new to me when I joined ESA Homelands. Basically, it's a machine image creator. You say to Pekka, I wish to have a Windows machine with these things installed on it from Windows Service Release 25, or whatever the case is, and voila, a new machine is available to run on your VMware or your, your infrastructure. We use Rundeck, which is our orchestration tool. I won't bother talking too much now because most of my talk is about what we did with Rundeck. OpenStack for our virtualization, although we do use some VMware as well. Um, OpenStack is the Python plug because OpenStack is purely Python based. If you're looking to do any kind of VM type stuff and you don't wish to pay VMware any money, OpenStack is exactly is an excellent orchestration uh, virtualization tool. We use Docker, containerization. Um, if you know what Docker is, I don't have to explain it. If you don't know what Docker is, it really helps. We use Harbor because we build our own Docker containers and we serve them internally. So Harbor is our, our container registry. Um, it's worth noting here, the side note, we used to run Docker's own trusted registry, which you could run on-premise. It was fine, but not as good as it could have been. Harbor was a surprisingly good tool we found when we went hunting around. So one of my recommendations, if you're hosting your own Docker containers, give Harbor a look. Our internal Git is uh, GitLab, we use it for both Git and continuous integrations. So everything goes through its own tooling, run on premise. And then we supply our developers with Yeoman so that at least when they make a new project and push it, it at least has the right bits attached. Yeoman is very much like cookie cutter, it's a template generator, or it's a templating tool that you can use to generate temp uh, project templates. Secrets are managed with Vault. Um, I say that somewhat tongue-in-cheek, like every organization around, there's obviously a certain set of less than secure passwords that are still being used in various places. This is, um, I see some various sage nods thinking, yes, you do that as well. Everyone does. But technically, the real important stuff is in Vault, and we use etcd as a key value store. And I only list these things as a, a set of tools that may or may not be obvious to everyone that you might not know about that might be useful. Um, sorry, I skipped one. We use Nginx. Again, it's a web server. I don't know what Nginx is. That said, we are still running a large portion of our stuff on VMware, which obviously is not open source. But what did we do? We took Packer templates, basically. Almost all the servers in Prod and our labs are now derived from Packer templates. I say almost all, again, like every organization of a certain size and age, somewhere in the corner of your system, there's a 2003 Windows box running a tool that somebody made 15 years ago, hasn't been updated, the vendor's gone out of business, you can't replace it, you can't do anything, but now you need that. So we have to replicate the crusty ones, but thankfully our, our crusty server to new server ratio is quite low. So we've got a couple of crusty ones we have to carefully shepherd, and the rest of it can come from new machines. OpenSSH is installed on all our Windows boxes. This is something you can do. Um, it seems to surprise people when we mention it. Um, it's perfectly readily available these days. You can run OpenSSH on all your Windows boxes and never have to use RDP again. We install monitoring and logging tools and everything into Logstash, so basically we're, we're, we're log shipping all the logs from our own services. We collect all the metrics from our dockers and our hosts, and the Windows events get logged as well. I hasten to add, um, it's worth noting, we don't log for long. If you log every, if you take 50 Windows servers, 40 Windows servers, and log all their events, you will fill any hard drive you could choose to buy in a couple of days. So we clean up after three days, but at least if something goes wrong before three days are up, we can find the problem. And we had a common public SSH key, which is hardly rocket science. So we don't have to keep remembering all those passwords. Um, because we're at a Python conference, it's worth mentioning, we do run Python on every server as well, with some useful libraries, uh, requests, and ptpython, and atters, and pipenv, and various things like that are on all our servers. We went with Rundeck. Rundeck is a, an orchestration tool. It's much like Ansible, much like Chef, much like various tools like that. You define all your jobs in YAML and you can use it to execute scripts on specific targets. So in most cases, those scripts are Python, Bash, or I didn't write it down because it seemed kind of heretical, but Node. Um, and we use PowerShell to control VMware and our Windows hosts if you must. It allows comprehensive scheduling. You can schedule you know, jobs to run any time, any number of kind of six times a day, once a day at midnight kind of thing. It can be threaded as in it can talk to more than one host at a time. Not can't do more than one thing on that host at a time, but it can talk to more than one at a time. It's API-driven. You can control everything by an API with some tooling you might develop yourself. 
and it gives you a full history on everything. Um, we are a financial institution. Anybody who works for a financial institution knows that about eight months out of the year, you have auditors on site asking you daft questions like, can you tell me six months ago who proved a 1% interest rate reduction in Bob's account? You need to have that stuff written down somewhere, which is what Rundick does for us. There's a short little demo video that I recorded, which, because this is a demo, isn't going to run. Um, that little cursor should have moved by now. So swiftly moving along and pretending that wasn't there. Um, why did we use Rundeck? As you can see, it's a GUI tool. Um, one of the points I want to get across today is we could have used Puppet, Ansible, Chef, insert favorite tool here. We used something we found. It's got a GUI, so it's easy for our non-development team, our frontline support guys, our BAs, everybody knows enough to be able to at least click the right buttons. The YAML-based config is pretty easy to understand. I'm a JSON fan, but so be it, YAML it is. And here's my important point. It does the job well enough so we can move on to the next problem. Ultimately, if you work for a company, and most of us do, you could spend forever trying to find the right tool and obsessing and trying the next one and say, well, this is not quite right, so we'll try this one instead. We found one that worked well enough, we stuck with it. Um, how we use it? We have an internal Python and Node.js set of tooling which builds our Rundeck YAML config from an even simpler YAML config. So we can give to our, our uh, less technically capable people a pretty simple YAML config that pretty much is, what is the thing called? What script does it run? What host does it run on? When does it run? That kind of thing. We upload new jobs to our Git repo, our GitLab. We don't interact with Rundeck directly, specifically. So your developers can add or remove jobs as they need to without needing to know how the rest of the system works at all. They just check jobs into Git and voila, magically they appear. And Git branching means our teams can do their own thing without affecting anyone else. We don't let you check in jobs, and I hope this isn't a surprise, to the stuff that affects prod without it going through some kind of configuration checking. But in your own team, in your own run deck, in your own lab, you can do whatever you like. Um, if it breaks everything, you will come crying to us, but otherwise, everyone can do what they like, which is we achieve through Git branching. Some of the other stuff we've got around to installing that's useful, we validate our infrastructure with inspec. I mentioned a set of tools like this in this talk because it is, there are things that aren't necessarily obvious that people don't necessarily know about, but they are worth looking at and, and, and using. Inspec is a very funky tool. It is written in Ruby, which means you need to wrap your head a little bit around it if you wanted to do more than the simple stuff. But Inspec's job is basically to check that what your system says it did has been done. It validates the infrastructure it exists. So if I installed six Windows servers and they're all running SSH with a common key, I would have an inspect test that literally goes and says, yes, I spoke to all your servers, they all said yes. Um, if they're all supposed to have a 20 gigabyte D drive, you can have an inspect test for that, that kind of thing. We also deploy a series of monitoring tools, and again, this is useful for our automated infrastructure. We have Prometheus pulling in metrics from everywhere. Everything is measured. We use the Elk stack, which I may or may not be familiar. It's Elasticsearch, sorry, Elasticsearch. It's, um, yeah, sorry, it is Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana for pretty much gathering your data, finding the, the, the logs and the stuff you're interested in, and looking at it in a, in a useful way. And we add Grafana to that as well, because pretty pictures are nice for seeing what's going on in your system. These are all open source tools. We deploy them all um, off the shelf or customize them as we wish. Don't have to pay anything for any of them. You can find out a heck of a lot about your systems just by deploying a series of these tools. And as I mentioned a couple of slides earlier, tools like FileBeat and um, the like that'll actually tell you stuff about the computers you're running on, you can figure out a heck of a lot about your system just with a set of tools like that. Everything that isn't homemade, our homemade c -sharp system, uh, uh tool that the business runs on is a series of Windows services. Okay. Be that as may, that was the decision that was made 10 years ago. We're getting towards changing it, but the new stuff we deploy all we deploy everything is Docker. All our internally developed tooling goes into Docker, and we control Docker via Portainer, which is another useful tool that you might. Portainer is a GUI for controlling Docker. So, whereas if somebody comes to me and says the service, you know, your Prometheus in my lab doesn't work, I would SSH to their machine because I like cold, glowing black screens and, and white text and typing at them. If I don't have to use the mouse at all, I'm quite happy. I'd SSH to the machine and go and check Docker PS, etc. But Portainer is a GUI-fied way of doing that runs in a browser, it's quite a useful tool. In terms of container deployment and development, also a useful thing that we've done, which is maybe worth considering. Everything we use that runs in Docker, 
our third party tools, Prometheus and Logstash and everything I've just mentioned, Rundeck and so forth, and stuff we developed ourselves, everything goes into our own DTR. We don't pull it from the, the web at all. Well, we do once, that's how we get it, but we serve it after that in our own internal one. Again, we let teams upload whatever they like to their own areas. So team A can upload containers to, uh, sorry, images to their own repo. Um, team B can upload images to their own repo, et cetera, et cetera. We don't let it go to prod unless a ticket says we should and we've tested it and approved it. And again, I hope that's not a giant surprise. I hope everyone at least does that. Um, although, I'll confess, I have occasionally deployed things to prod accidentally that weren't ticketed, but fair enough. The boss isn't here. We also use CI tooling, so a useful thing to have, GitLab or, um, I've gone blank on any others, Jenkins or in, you know, insert CI tool here. Very useful way to make sure that the Docker containers that you've started to have insisted people use your services all at least work, um, as in they've all got a suitable label and the right network and the right et cetera. And then as I mentioned, Yeoman, we provide a Yeoman template so that if you want to start a new project that works with the rest of our system, you simply literally start with the template. It tells you are you doing Docker or Node or Python or whatever you are. Docker files made for you, GitLab ignore is made for you, GitLab CI file is made so that it'll build itself when you check things in. That kind of stuff is all very helpful. The reason I mention all this stuff is just that what it allows us to do as the DevOps team is make sure that the other guys, the guys writing the C-sharp, the guys who actually help SA Home Loans make a living, don't have to worry about any of this. If they have a new tool to write, if they have a new something to do, they're simply the infrastructure is there, they sit down and they know that in their lab, Prometheus will be there, it'll give them the logs that they want. If they want a new tool, they can write one, they can upload one, they don't have to worry about any of the infrastructure, they don't have to understand how our system fits together, they just have to work on the bit that they have to worry about. I would like it if they understood how the system fits together, but. Quick talk on what we've done with existing scripts. Docker containers are also useful to take that series of scripts you've got lying around that have been collecting dust for 15 years that do various things. And the, the beauty behind Docker is you put all your existing scripts that do a variety of things in a Docker, you can make them all work exactly the same way. So the black box of Docker may be a mystery to your frontline support guy. It doesn't matter. He doesn't have to know Python. He doesn't have to know Ruby. He doesn't have to know whatever it was written in. You give him a container that works in the same way. It takes argument one, two, and three, and it does the magic. He doesn't care what it's doing. It's a very useful, powerful tool. And again, because we do it in Rundeck, um, we deploy that kind of thing in Rundeck as well, so we get a level of auditing that otherwise somebody was writing down in a spreadsheet, on Monday, I rebooted server A. Um, that kind of thing is all recorded instead. And some of the reasons this is useful, some of the advantages this offers us. Rundeck, Portainer, the monitoring tools I've mentioned, all the services we deploy around it, they solve about 80% of the problems anybody has in their lab. Before, in our kind of manual driven days, any, any given week, a team, one team probably had a problem with their lab, so the DevOps team was spending at least a day a week fixing team A's lab, then next week you know it's gonna be team B and team C the week after that. We get far less of that kind of thing because people can figure out what's going wrong. If the lab is completely buggered up, they just redeploy their Docker containers. New services, new everything, wipe it away, start again. It's a very useful thing to consider doing. We didn't realize to be honest, quite how much reduction we would get on our support requirements by going down a, a, a bit of automation. We did this in six months with a three-member team of senior developers. That team of senior developers included me, so clearly not super geniuses. Well, I mean, there were two super geniuses and me. But there were guys, it, 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 it takes some competence, you know, people who need to know what they're doing. But it's not rocket science. It didn't take us two years. We didn't have a team of 100. We didn't have to stop the company's other projects, drop everything, do this, and go back. There was no interruption to SA Home Loans delivery. The teams worked on as they worked on, and when we were re ready to roll this stuff out, we simply kind of moved it in as they went. It's now supported by a six-member team of people of various experience levels, and by that I mean the same three of us who, who made the system, plus three more very junior guys. To let them do it, we gave them some Python training and some Node training in-house for about two weeks, Every now and then, one of us has to go and sit at a junior chap's desk and say, look, um, this thing you don't understand, let me spend an hour with you and help you understand it. But again, we haven't spent a year training people to do this. We haven't had to, we've had to take the people we already had, upskill them a little bit, and the supporters, their abilities are, are more than good enough. I just added this line in here. I actually didn't have this line until about 10 minutes into the previous speaker's talk. Um, there are tools like Terraform, 
tools like that. And Terraform is infrastructure as code, is its whole job. You give it a whole heap of YAML otherwise, and you say, make me 15 servers, and they should look like this, and they should do that, and so forth, which sounds suspiciously like what I've just described across a vari variety of tools. We probably will look Terraform at some point. I only mentioned it to include it to mention, yes, we do know it exists. We haven't got there yet. But that does tie into my one of, one of my points is that, A, there's lots of ways to do it. B, get it good enough and get it rolled out rather than fight forever to figure out which tool is the absolute 100% best way to do it. Sorry, I've gone, okay, cool. I'm gonna take you to a practical example of the kind of thing we're talking about. This is um, how we moved our database backup work. We run SQL Server for most of our data, uh, Microsoft SQL Server, that is. We have a little bit of Postgres as well. We back all that stuff up, as any reasonable, responsible set of companies should be doing. It's also done with a collection of SQL Server jobs and some bash. SQL Server jobs, obviously, for the SQL Server, bash for the Postgres. We've moved all that now to Python-based Docker containers, which basically means we give the DBA team a run deck of their own. They can go schedule their backups whenever they want them. We can use the same host to talk to all our databases, where previously we had to have a special Windows machine that spoke to the databases so that it could see the prod databases on the network, and we had to have a special Linux machine that spoke to Postgres, and it could see those machines on the network. We just have one host now, because it's a Docker container. It'll run anyway. Uh, I say it'll run anyway. We don't run Docker on Windows if we can avoid it. Um, simply because, as a side note, Docker on Windows is Docker on a Linux VM on Windows. They're just hiding the Linux VM from you. So start with the Linux box, and you don't need the VM part. Is the, is the reason. And it gives you a consistent interface, uh, interface across all your database types, all your schemas, all your everything. Your Docker containers all look the same. Your images are all run in exactly the same way, which means different operations are all handled in the same way. Back up to local storage, which you do on SQL Server every night. There's a container that takes arguments, you know, host, location, runs. Copy those backup files to other hosts. There's a container that takes host, location, run. Restoring backup files is a container that takes host, location, run, etc. And standardized log shipping, again, you get, you get where I'm going with this. Everything runs the same way. Our DBA team is not big. They don't have all day to sit around filling with the scripts and so forth. If there's a problem, they've now got a, a pretty simple container. They go to the run deck, they find the job that says, make this thing work, and they click the button, and voila. We bake some common behavior into all those database images, which is all uh, Docker containers we build ourselves. We use Vault to store the database access right so the password isn't right in the Python file. PyWinRM, and again, I'm listing a series of tools which are useful to know about and may not be that obvious. PyWinRM, if you have to work with Windows boxes, is a fantastic piece of kit. PyWinRM is basically automated RDP. So you, tell to, you say to PyWinRM, I wish you to copy a file from this drive to that drive. So Whereas you would have to sit down and log into the machine on RDP and you'd open the Windows Explorer or the command line, depending how super advanced you are, and you'd type CP this thing to that thing. PyWinRM will do that remotely for you. Here's a, a Windows box, here are the credentials to how to get to it. RDP to it and move this file around for us, please. PyMSSQL, as the name suggests, SQL on SQL Server. It's how we talk to our SQL Server boxes. And etcd, I mentioned before, is a key value store. Etcd is a phenomenally powerful tool. You can run it with massive distributed clusters, and you can do all sorts of amazing things and keep data left, right, and center, and in synced and unsharded. We don't do any of that. We run etcd in a single host all by itself. It's a simple key value store. We say, here is string A. It has value 5. Keep that, please. Um, and then later we'll say, for string A, make it value 10 now. It's a, a, a key value store that lives at a, at a web host rather than locally. We use it for our databases basically to know that at 10.15, we backed them up. At 10.15, we copied them. But the last time we successfully restored one was 10 o'clock. So our automated tools can go and look and say, oh, well, I need to restore before I back up or what have you. And finally, they use some YAML config, which is they pull directly from Git. So if you don't want to back up table A anymore, you go to your YAML config and say, stop backing up table A. Um, with ogpass, so if you run some help, it'll at least tell you what the thing is supposed to do. Again, this took some effort. One of our DBAs spent a fair amount of time writing Python containers to do this, but he can give to the rest of his colleagues and the rest of our developers 
a series of containers that if you need some data in your lab to keep working on the job, that there's a problem you should have fixed yesterday, but you've been waiting for the DBA to help you for two days, now there's a container to do it for you. If I say to our junior DBA, maybe he's been around two months, I want you to restore some database you know nothing about and you've never seen it before, there's a level of confidence that he can at least begin to do it by finding the right job and understanding what that job does, rather than having to spend days trying to understand what the table does. And finally, moving on to the last bit, some lessons and some considerations, things we learned from doing this. Avoid manual fixes, if at all possible. And what I mean by this is, you've deployed all this lovely automatic stuff, you've got some wonderful buttons that do wonderful things, prod goes down. The service that is kind of accepting money from your customer has stopped working. The temptation, and it's a strong one, is to immediately go to prod, get to the right box, either RDP or SSH or physically sit in front of it, whatever it may be, fix it there and then. If at all possible, try and avoid that temptation. If it's a problem that can be fixed with something you've already written a script for and is already in run deck, sure, go and run that. Otherwise, you're better off sitting down writing that script now, getting into run deck and running it. It's a little bit slower, but the payoff is when that does happens next week, you can fix it in a minute. Um, it might take you an hour this time. You can obviously fix it much faster next time. Uh, obviously, that does take into account various management decisions. If, if nobody is paying you for a day, they may not be willing for you to explain, but it's so much better if I do it this way. But if you can, I'd strongly recommend doing it. It's worth asking your individual developers when you sit around to figure out how do I automate the manual process that we used to do for you. Ask them about stuff they do that you don't know about. We took our prod environment and we looked at the various servers and we said, okay, well obviously these are the jobs that we run to make this environment. We'll replicate that, we'll automate that. We'll hand it over to all our teams and say, all your prayers are answered, this will do everything you need in your lab. And about half the teams didn't ever tell us anything, but didn't, we didn't realize they were doing a whole bunch of other things to make their lab suitable to their need. Different teams work on different things, and they didn't even realize that we didn't know. They got so used to doing these things manually, they just did them without ever mentioning it. So it's worth walking around the office and saying, by the way, do you do, is there anything you can't do with this tool we've given you? Um, and if the answer is yes, well then, make it so the tool can. Descriptive naming of your automated jobs cuts down on your support requirements. This sounds obvious, maybe it should be obvious, maybe it is obvious, but there's lots of crud that builds up over the years in organizations I've worked in, and I assume it's not uncommon, that script one, dot bat, fixes that problem where the server's fallen over and it needs to be restarted over lunch. Now, we all know script one dot bat is the right thing to run. It doesn't tell you anything when you say to the new guy, the server's fallen over lunch, after lunch, what can you do about it? He said, well, I know what I'll do. I'll find script one dot bat. Of course he doesn't, he's never heard of it. If you've got a, a tool that says, restart the server after it has fallen off after lunch, which, okay, our naming isn't that ridiculous, but that's the idea, you should be able to find it, and it's much easier to figure out what's going on if stuff has good names. This is not unique to DevOps, this has been true of software development you know, lifetime over, but it's a useful lesson to keep in mind. It is easy to underestimate the number of stuff that we do as companies that nobody has written down anyway. Similar to the point I was making about manual stuff earlier, it's quite easy to think, well, okay, we've, we've taken all the, the documented steps that you know, Joe used to follow to make their environment, this must be right. Only to realize that because Joe's done it for 10 years, he knows that about six steps down, he needs to right-click the box and say, you know, update the problem obligator. That's not written anyway. It's easy to underestimate how much of that stuff is in people's heads in your organization. Hopefully you catch it before, while those people are in your organization. What normally happens is six months later, somebody says, how do we update the problem obligator? And so, well, Joe used to know, but Joe's not here. So it's easy, it's worth figuring that out before the time comes. Consistent look and feel of your related tasks the example I was giving the DB stuff or otherwise, this is helpful. It's, it's, easy, it's much easier to get going on a system if you can sit down and say, well, this tool works like this. All the tools take exactly the same set of arguments. They look the same way. They produce the same output. It just makes it much easier to work with your system. And finally, this is a fairly important one. If at all possible, and you've gone down an automation road and you've chosen Run Deck or Ansible or Chef or whatever you're using, allow your jobs to be rerun, if at all possible, without breaking anything. Obviously, this isn't always possible. If the job literally deleted a server, well then, you know, you can run it again, but the server's already gone. Um, but things like prepping boxes and Windows sys prepping and stuff that is destructive if done a second time, it's worth making, putting in guarding mechanisms so you don't accidentally break something by running the same job again, because humans will do that. 
I have done it many times. I have the memory, effectively, of an amnesiac goldfish. I will come to work in the morning and think, oh, I was supposed to do that yesterday. Forgot I did that yesterday anyhow. Click those buttons, and if I wasn't careful, break a whole bunch of stuff that I needn't have broken. So this is over, it's, it's, it's easy to overlook. It's easy to write the job to just do what the job does. It's incredibly helpful if the job not only does the right thing, but doesn't do the wrong thing as well. And that is all I've got. So I think I've just made it in time, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so take some questions if anyone has any. Any questions? Uh, yeah, um, I have so many questions, but uh, first I can totally relate. So I think mm -hmm. I've done this at least twice in my career. Um, first thing, the the idea of making things consistent so that they look the same. Mm -hmm. uh, there's actually a word for that. It's the principle of least surprise. That's the one. Yeah. yeah I had that written a, down at some point and then forgot. <laughs> it's in my notes for the talk, <laughs> but not actually in the talk. Yeah. It's it's very useful when you're working with something. It works the way you expect it to. Mm -hmm. No surprises. It gets things done faster. Um, the first question, that six months that you took to do this, hmm. uh, was that dedicated entirely to this project? Uh, pretty much, Or do much, you have yeah. to do other... Uh, we, my time was more or less dedicated, and my colleague was more or less dedicated, and one of my other colleagues was probably spending 80% of his time on it. So yeah, I call it dedicated, effectively. Okay, yeah. so no production interruptions every five not, months? Not to a large degree, no, yeah. That's yeah. pretty good. Well, um, effectively, because we carved out a team to do just this. You, know, you had teams. sponsor buy and someone gave you uh, permission to go ahead and do exactly this. Exactly right, yeah. yeah. Okay, my second question was open SSH and Windows. Mm. Uh, I know it can be done, but uh, in my experience, it's a, it's a very poor uh, SSH experience. It's very difficult to keep running reliably. Oh, Is no, it better no. these days? It's good enough for what we need. Uh, very seldom do we actually physically sit down and SSH into the machine ourselves and type commands at it. It's entirely so that Rundeck can talk to the Windows boxes. Um, yes, if I had a whole bunch of stuff to do on the box, I wouldn't do it myself. Via SSH, I would go over RDP. Um, because its tab completion is non-existent, and it's 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 a it's a bad experience for a user. For a machine, it's perfectly adequate to, to talk to the box and have it do all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Yes. Any other questions? Harbor as a Docker registry does it let you actually delete Docker images? Yes. Um, I will be installing it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> we've we've run the experiments. We've deleted them, and they left the disk which is unusual <laughs> compared to some of the other tools, yeah. It's, as a side note, it's worth mentioning, Hob is actually a, a project of the VMware team, which is, a, they must have bought it because it looks like nothing else VMware have ever done. So they bought this project from somewhere, but it's very good, yeah. All right, um, I noticed that you decided to run your own infrastructure. You mm -hmm. never really crossed the pod why you do that. Like, are there legal restrictions or uh, what? Fair enough, sorry, I, I obviously start with the assumption that, of course, I know that, but yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's a series of reasons. We've been around for 15 years, so obviously running your own infrastructure was what you did 15 years ago. That wasn't an option. We are looking cloud, that kind of thing. We haven't got to that degree yet, but it's mainly, inertia is not the right word. It's mainly because that's what we've got. That's what we work on, and we have our own stuff. Um, and also because, yeah, there are a certain amount of legal restrictions to data privacy and so forth, but yeah, that's overcome. You could do that all that in the cloud. We just haven't got to that point. Uh, yeah. And the Windows aspect, is that part of the Legacy problem? thing. Uh, oh. the, the system was developed on Windows, so it must run on Windows at the moment. That's the, yeah. Hmm. Any further questions? Okay, and let's thank the speaker.